Welcome to Explorations. Today we're talking with Paul Costello, the founder and director of StoryWise.com and the Center for Narrative Studies. Since 1995, Paul has been researching new ways to unleash the power of story and apply it to some of the most challenging issues of our time. In this last of a five-part interview, Paul discusses his fascination with presidential politics and the narratives that candidates weave to successfully get elected and govern. So let's get to it. Let's, let's wrap up. I uh, want to talk to you a little bit about the presidential plot. You wrote a lovely book. It's more than a lovely book. I think a powerful book back uh, around 2008. Yeah. Um, and you began looking at, um, at the presidential election uh, not through the, the lens of conspiracy when we think of plot, but we think, but in terms of as a, as a literary device. Mm -hmm. And I think your insights were remarkable. So uh, tell me a little bit about how you got going with that project and, and what, what are some of the things uh, that were just pivotal for you in the thinking about that? And then maybe if we could uh, bring the lens of that toward the last election we just walked awesome. through, which has been an interesting one. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think a part of it might have been I was I was taking a break from the Irish program, and I watching uh, watching you know the politics as you do as our spectator sport here in Washington, and realizing that everyone was talking about the narrative, you know, will, you know, and that was the two thousand and eight election, and that was Hillary Clinton, John McCain, Barack Obama, and it's like. And the, and the pundits, so when the pundits are throwing the word around narrative, when they're throwing it around like as if they're, I kind of felt, I kind of reacted a bit and thought, wow, I mean, do they even know what they're talking about? I guess it was a sort of some sense of professional jealousy there or saying, you know, hey, you're using my word. Who, who gave you the permission to use my word? So part of it was kind of like, what would a, a if, if I was going to, unravel for myself and for them, what is a narrative approach to the political election? Uh, what would that look like? And then un untangling it and saying, you know, yeah, it, they, a candidate is constructing a story and it has to have characters and a ca main character and has to have a plot and it's particular audiences. So to think of it that way, uh, and my challenge was having 24 seven cable, my challenge was, can I use this approach and say something fresh or something new that hasn't been said already? That was my challenge. And, and discovered that, yeah, I was quite intrigued by that sort of way of, so it came up with things like, um, you know, beginning, middle and end, that whole narrative design thing that Obama was a beginning, he had no track record at all. The biggest success of his life up, up till then, his biggest success was getting nominated. He'd failed in the first election. He had no record. He'd been a year and a half in the Senate. He was a beginning, fresh energy. We projected onto him all our dreams and our hopes. And McCain was a warrior. He was, he was at the last chapter of his life. This would be the last time he'd run for public office. He'd been a war hero. He'd been a senator. He'd been a senior senator. So like he was at the end, Obama's at the beginning and there's, old Hil there's dear old Hillary in the middle complicated with such a vast history now in one respect if you interpreted that as competency and experience she would she'd be the only one who'd get an interview for the job uh or she she and mccain would obama wouldn't even get an interview so you suddenly think you know those three positions and then it depends not on them but on the audience what was america ready for in 2008 well after eight years of Bush and the war and 9-11, you know, my pundit in that book, and it was published before the election, but when I tease it out, which is the story that has the most energy and what are the, what are, what's the audience ready for? I just thought Obama's going to win this because we're ready for, we're ready for some freshness. We need some newness here. We, we're tired. The energy's gone out of this system. Well, the euphoria of Obama then almost became his undoing, you know, it's like he, he over promised and under delivered, like, or not that it was his fault. We thought he was the coming of the Messiah. Um, and so like, and again, if not that he would be calling me, but if, if he'd be, if I'd be telling him in the first year of his presidency, tone it down, tone it down. It's horrible to peak too early. You've like, 
if it goes downhill, start low and build high. <laughs> That's narrative design. You know, like in a Broadway, the five best songs of Hamilton are not in the first 10 minutes. <laughs> like it's downhill all the way then. So in terms of narrative design around a political campaign, how you face things, you know you're going to get lost in the middle. And for this current election, again, if President Trump called me, I'd be warning him, you're going to get lost in the middle. You've got to build a bridge. You've got to build a, a persuasive argument to remind us why you ran in the first place and what's unfinished business. Well, they didn't even bother with the platform. Yeah. So now to be speaking, it's like... <laughs> they said, help the hell with the story. Yeah, except that I'm big enough... I'm the story and that's all you need. And um, so, I mean, when you put the narrative design lens onto a presidential campaign, it illuminates sort of some of the, some of the meaning making that has to be constructed by a candidate and an audience and what they have to do, even in a symbolic way, um, to, to keep that story coherent knowing that your opponent is always trying to knock it off balance, trying to make it contradictory, trying to attack, dis, dis, you know, try to destabilize the coherency of it. Um, you know, you said this, but now you're doing this, like trying to attack character in terms of c coherency, you know? Um, and then with this current one, just to finish up, like I was thinking the last couple of days, the power of story that the Trump world, I think, has just become an empire and we are all, we've consumed it in an obsessive way. I have, I, I, the media has, I just think we've had four years where that story is like, has become an empire and we have not been able to, even with him losing the election, tomorrow we're back, it's like impeachment too, <laughs> like Star Wars too. This story has been as epidemic as as the as as the COVID. It's like we are we've consumed this story in in a way that I, I think is quite unique. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Just looking down the road, is that how does this country um, find a, a remedy <laughs> to the infection? And, right. Yeah. And how, how is it that this story, which has pervaded our consciousness for four years plus, um, how does it begin to recede into the backdrop and a new story can emerge? And it's not clear yet, but uh, right. I, I, I'm hopeful. I think that there's going to be things on the ground. We talk about putting things on the ground, yeah. um, but uh, there, there seems to be a wave. We thought, you know, it's interesting looking at this wave, the GM comes out and says they're going to go all electric and, 20, by, in, in 2035, you know, if you watch the football game last night, they're, they're touting their electric cars. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> Who would have thought? Well, suddenly, suddenly the, the setting has changed profoundly and it's, it's made, it's made a, a new path possible that, uh, that people have been talking about. And if Biden does it well, he'll be able to, um, he'll be able to claim that um, in some profound way. So well, I think he, he Maybe he's watching reruns late at night in the White House of Mr. Smith goes to Washington or something. But it's like this: the, if you again, if you're scripting a character that he needs to play, and to think of it that you know, it's it's a principle of narrative design in a way. It's like what it is you don't what it is isn't what it is. It's it depends on what comes before and what comes after. That's what it is because it's like it's positioned. It's in between. So. If Biden is in between Trump and maybe Harris or whoever, but it's like, then just like Trump came in to repudiate everything that Obama did, you know, I'm not him. Well, then what is Biden like? It's like, if you construct it as a story, I, I see hopeful signs, meaning that Biden is like Mr. Smith, you know, I'm, I'm from the hometown and I'm here, a man of principle and I may be hokey, and I may be boring and I may be garrulous, but I deep in my heart, I care. And, uh, and I'm going to help the American people. Uh, if I don't, if negotiation doesn't work, I'm going to help the American people. I think, wow. I mean, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm not saying it's not authentic, but, 
but there's a meaning making system much bigger than Biden and us. It's like he's he's got to be clear what story he's creating for the ages. Um, you know, it's like uh, turning what I say is it, to turn, um, you know, to turn hindsight into foresight by using insight, meaning that in 20 years time, what will we remember you as? And that means that Biden coming off Trump has the chance to be a savior, bring the country together, heal the country and like, but be direct and be decisive. And it's like, wow, he, he, it's a little bit like Pope John the 23rd, you know, the, the church elected him as an old man thinking that he was an interim, you know, John the 23rd, he's just going to be kiss babies and bless with holy water. And he's not going to do much. But deep down, he was a radical <laughs> playing it safe until he becomes Pope. And then holy mackerel is still the, the church still hasn't got over him. Yeah. And, uh, and I think Biden has the potential to be that kind of uh, transformative president. Um, and it, it's just going to be fascinating to watch as the story unfolds. Right. And, you know, as a character, you think of, you know, maybe he's more like a Gandalf, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the Hobbit. He's, he, he's, he's this old wizard who's, who's been through many wars and, and he's seen a lot of things and he understands a lot of things. And yeah. he's, he also has, uh, he also knows that it's a long story. It's not over, you know, nothing's over tomorrow. It's, uh, um, so I, I think he has the capacity to do something that maybe hasn't been done in a long while. Well, you know, if you wanted a story or a paradigm, you know, um, and this is the thing, you see, I, I, I think since they are creating a fiction and it is a piece of literature really in terms of, then I don't know, like, I don't know, I'm sure there's some political advisors with this, but it's kind of like, you know, if you're thinking about a president's best advice, it could be the literary professor from Harvard rather than the pollster. And then if the literary professor might say, and he'll say to them, what should I be reading? Tell me what I should be reading. Tell me what I should be watching. And, and the person might say, Charles Dickens, The Christmas Carol. You've got to, you've got to read and watch The Christmas Carol because the president's day is the character. And this character has gone from Scrooge before Scrooge before the three, three ghosts and Scrooge after the three ghosts. So you have to be Scrooge after the three ghosts. And Trump has to be the Scrooge before the three three goes mean and nasty and and everyone boo hiss and then suddenly transformed into this gentle, kind, lovely, wonderful old man, but no pushover, but still just the, the milk of human kindness will flow out. We're buying turkeys for, for tiny Tim and people are weeping and like there's the flip. There's the flip. And if you're conscious. Because I think Trump, Trump had that, you know, I, I still, there's a scene that I, I was writing about this morning, you know, when Trump, came, President Trump came out of uh, hospital, I almost said prison, but actually when he came out of hospital <laughs> and he, and he, they brought him back to the White House and he gets off the Marine One and then goes onto the portico of the White House and just stands there and takes his mask off. off. <laughs> it's kind of like. He is he doing an audition for Birth of a Nation or who's the famous filmmaker from the Nuremberg rallies? It's like oh, right. he, he is playing a cinematic part there. It's like <laughs> it's like so I just think same like with Ronald Reagan. I, I think successful politicians are portraying the character for the story they want us to remember. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to end on that note. Yeah. Interesting <laughs> image, and uh, one, I want to thank you for taking an hour out of your out of your day. And no worries, Rick. And I just look forward to continuing this conversation because oh, I, I always love the story doesn't end. Yeah.